So we are in a mini-series called Who is Jesus? And, you know, it used to be something that most people knew who Jesus was, but things have changed. A lot of folks don't know who Jesus is. They think he is some great moral teacher, uh, kind of like Buddha or, you know, a great teacher like that, an ascended master, a shaman or something like that. He's a good guy, and we like the teachings of Jesus. We can learn a lot from Jesus, and he's not the son of God, but he's a good guy. Most people believe he actually exists today. There's conclusive evidence, no matter who you are, that Jesus exists. But a lot of people have different ideas about Jesus. He's just one of many ways you can go to, I, might, I don't believe this, but this is what people say. He's just one, one of the many ways to connect to God. And so how do you know who Jesus is? It's the most important question anyone can ask. Who is Jesus? You know, I, as much as I, I I'm not gonna mention just certain things I like a lot. Uh, there's, a, there's a man that wears a red jumpsuit and has a long flowing beard that rides around in a sled and he's able to fly and uh, I love that I really do I even like the tooth fairy I don't like the tooth fairy anymore because I don't want to lose my teeth anymore you know it's expensive to get a crown but back when I was a kid I loved the tooth fairy I think it's great today if he came out punch him in the nose but back then I liked him you know you, you lost your tooth and the tooth fairy would come at night and you get I don't know what the, what's the going rate today I used to get a dollar what's the going rate and just for inflation what is it like $15 what do you got? A buck. That's a man I like. Yeah, right. So, I don't know. Some people give their kids 20 bucks. I don't know. But uh, at our house, it's still one. I don't want to lose any teeth, however. That's not funny. But we like those type of folklore. I like, you know. But God is not a figment of our imagination. He is real. And who is Jesus is one of the most important things that you can do. And there's been a lot of research lately. A lot of people were kind of upset because they always depicted Jesus as blonde-haired, blue-eyed with sandals, looked like he came from Southern California, even had a perm and highlights. <laughs> but we're finding out that he didn't come from Southern California, doesn't have a perm or highlights. But he, actually, he's probably more, more like a Colombian or a Brazilian or I think he even looks, looks a little Italian, you know? He's got the dark hair, brown eyes. And in fact, I, I don't know if you've heard this before, but sometimes people think that Jesus might have been Italian. Uh, there's been studies about that. And, and the reason is, is because of the, it's the surrounding evidence about it. Because he lived at home until he was 30. <laughs> took over the family business. And his mother thought he was God. So... Someone told me in the last service that Brazilians think that too. And I, anyhow, but yeah, no, he, Jesus is not, Jesus is God. And, and how do we know that? And today we're going to look about Jesus and what we say about Jesus. A lot of people have different ideas. Well, I think Jesus is this way. My, Je listen, first of all, I don't have Jesus. Jesus has me. And I heard of a, 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 a young girl was drawing a picture. And her mother came up to her and said, what are you drawing, sweetheart? A four-year-old, I'm drawing God. She goes, no one knows who God looks like. They will when I'm done. A lot of people have their right they draw their own picture of God. Well, my Jesus says it's okay to do this. My Jesus says this. Well, that's not what it's all about. There's a reason Jesus was crucified. So the next two weeks we're going to look at, today we're going to look at who Jesus is. And the next week we're going to look at why did he have to die? And what evidence is there that he actually, what biblical prophecies? And by the way, you're going to be blown away next week. We're going to show you how we actually pinpoint the book of Daniel pinpoints when Christ is going to come. We'll talk about that next week. And also, I'm going to believe a move of God next week. What I mean by that is we're going to enact what it means that Christ rose from the dead and what that means as we prepare for Easter. But today, who is Jesus? We're going to go ahead and look at some scripture verses. Let's pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for these wonderful people that are here today. Lord, I pray that somehow, some way, I'd be able to do you justice anyhow, Lord. I pray you speak through me. Holy Spirit, I welcome you to this place. We pray that we would know you more as we walk out of here today. And Lord, not just information, but we're praying for transformation by a renewed mind and a renewed spirit. And Father, once again, we pray that everyone would know that you're not mad at them, that you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Jesus is hanging out with his disciples. We're going to read a passage of Scripture. They're going to go back line by line, verse by verse. By the way, I like to look at the Scripture. I believe the Scripture is the Word of God. 
Uh, we've taught on it and we believe it. We believe the 66 books of the Bible are inspired by the Holy Spirit. We've done a lot of studies on it. You can go in our, our sermon series uh, about the Bible and learn about it. We believe that. And so we're going to read about it today. Then we're going to go line by line, verse by verse. So first we'll read it. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then, this is the part that puzzles me, then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one he was the Christ. Now, why on earth did Jesus tell them not to share the good news. Isn't that the way, the reason he came? Listen, everybody, it's very important. You don't always just spew out all the information you know. It's good to ask God what I should share. And Jesus had a mission and he had a purpose to be here. First of all, his mission was to be the sacrificial lamb, which we'll explain next week, to take away the sins of the earth. But he also came to inaugurate a new kingdom. Now, people ask this question all the time, and I, I ask myself the same question. Why is it taking God so long to come back? It, why does he have to come back twice? And, and, and part of the reason he was put on the cross, by the way, because they thought it was a one and done. Instead, there's stages of it. And I remember being in, in, a, in a class where, you know, a little kid, I remember they used to put like a baking, we used to make these volcanoes. They still do the volcanoes today in fourth grade in grammar school. Oh, I'm sorry, elementary school. For all of you below the age of 30, grammar school is what we used to call elementary school. Okay? We don't care about grammar anymore. But anyhow, so what you do is you'd, you'd, make a, you'd make a volcano and you'd put some baking soda and you'd put vinegar. What would happen? There's, there's a reaction. Or my favorite is Mentos and Coca-Cola. Anyhow, so you, you put it in there and there's a reaction, right? Well, what happened is when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he died on the cross, he started a reaction. Something is happening. There was a reaction, there was a settling, and even right now, I believe that reaction is still taking place until that reaction completes, then he's coming back the second time. And so the Bible says a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. To us, it's a long time. But we're part of this chemical reaction. When Jesus died on the cross, everything changed, right? And right now, I believe God is waiting for a certain number of people. I don't know the reason why, but there's going to come a time where he will come back. And it's getting closer and closer and closer. There's a reaction time. And almost like he kind of put the ax, he kind of marked it the roots of the trees, and Mark, he's going to come back to complete it. He began internally first, and then he'll deal externally. And by the way, if you want to change your life, it's always best to start from the inside out, not from the outside in. Though the outside in does have an effect, but much better is to go from the inside, inside out. And, and so Jesus did that, and so uh, that's is what we begin to happen. Now, why did he wait so long? Well, well what happened was this. A week or two after this statement, what began to happen to him is uh, he began to show who he was. And the entire Palm Sunday situation happened where everyone's hailed king of the Jews. And people began to worship him. And then the religious leaders like, uh-uh, this ain't going to happen. He's going to have to die. So Jesus knew the moment he gave his true identity, there would be his death sentence. So he had a certain mission he had to accomplish to build up the new believers to continue the ministry after after he went to continue on. That was part of it. And the other part was to die on the cross and to pay for our sins. So he had a purpose. And as a result of that, he knew his purpose. That's why we got to be wise about how we deal with situations. Just because you know it, you don't blurt it out. Be careful and understand timing is everything. Timing is everything. So let's go back and look at what we're talking about here. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. Now, what is the Caesarea Philippi? I've been there on a trip to Israel, 
right now it's a beautiful place. Uh, go ahead and show the map if you could be so kind. There's a map that's up there, and I'll show it here as well. Um, okay, what happened? Where's the map? Oh, I went the wrong way. Hang on. Ah, there we go. All right, there, so what it is, uh, Capra, uh, Sea of Galilee is the place where Jesus spent the majority of his ministry, about 30 miles north to, at the base of Mount Hermon, which is the highest mountain in that area, is Caesarea Philippi. Go ahead and show, if you could, the, uh, the, the first picture there, this picture. Thank you. Uh, and right there, there is a place where the base of the, the, the Mount Hermon begins to develop rivers, and this river begins the Jordan River. So Jesus went to the very mouth of the beginning of the Jordan River. It was also a place, a, 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 a heathen place, a place like a mini Las Vegas, but even worse. It was bad. It was a metropolitan area. It was a place void of Jewish culture. It was steeped in all kinds of debauchery, steeped in uh, worship of many different gods, of sexual immorality. It was a bad place. Whatever happens in Caesarea Philippi, no, it doesn't. You take it home with you. Okay. I'm a little worried about you guys. <laughs> so let me, let me show you what else happened there. And the next picture would be so kind. And, and so this is an artist's rendition. It was probably what it was like back in that time. And you had the temple of Caesar Augustus. You had that there. You had the shrine god, the Pan. Now, what, actually, it used to be called Pan before it was called. And uh, we'll talk about that in a few moments. But then you had a place, a t temple of Zeus. And they had a temple of Pan where we come from the mythological god, Pan, uh, uh, Panias, actually his name, and a mythological god named Pan, who was half man and half goat, or actually half boy and half goat. And he would play those horrible, you ever see those little pipes? They, you know, those little, those silly little things, what are you, a pan flute? Who plays a pan flute here? Okay. God bless you. They're, they're beautiful instruments. We love pan flutes here at Cornerstone Church. In fact, there's a guy on TV. How many have seen the advertisement? He sold more albums than the Beatles and Elbows combined. Woo okay, whatever. So this pan flute, he would play the pan flute, and he would kind of dance around. And in fact, we get the word, and he, was, he wore green. He came from the forest, and he would scare people with forest noise. And by the way, uh, Disney got a hold of it and made Peter Pan. That's where it comes from, Pan, the gut mythological god. There's a little guy who walks around with tights and played the flute. Okay, so God bless them. I'm, I'm not gonna, there's no judgment zone here. We're going to talk about Pan, Peter Pan. Okay, but what would happen was he was a, he was a false god. And what, actually the word, we have the English word that comes from this. If you hear the word panic, it comes from pan because people were freaking out when they used to hear things out of the, out of the uh, forest. So it comes the word panic. Aren't you glad you came to Cornerstone today? You can talk about that. That's why I do not have Peter, Peter Pan peanut butter. I have Jiffy for that reason. <laughs> So that's kind of what happened, okay? So, and by the way, to make matters even worse, they would worship this pan god, okay? And this is the time of Jesus. And they would have, and listen, this is historical, I'm not making this up, but they would have bestiality with the goats. I'm just saying, just saying, pretty sick stuff happened in those days. You think it's bad now? It was even worse back then, even worse. So, who do people say who Jesus is? That's the question. Who do people say Jesus is? That Jesus asked the disciples that. Now, when Jesus came to Philippi, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, interesting, he uses Son of Man. He kind of says, like, who do, you, who do people say God is? Who do people say the God who I am is? Because he said that son of, son of Man. Son of Man was always used as a depiction of the Messiah or God. It's used over 30 times in the book of Matthew alone. So what does the Son of Man mean? Well, we're going to look at it in a few moments. It's all through Scripture. For example, you can see it in Daniel. By the way, one of the most amazing books of the Bible. Daniel prophesizes so much. In Daniel 7, 1, it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came uh, to the ancient of days and was presented before him. So it talks about the son of man. Also says in Matthew 24, this is Jesus speaking, 
Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, talking about himself, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Again, this is the second place. And Daniel talks about the two comings of Christ. We'll talk about next week. It's going to be pretty cool. You'll want to miss out next week as we talk about that. And Revelation 1-7, it says the following, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. I always found it interesting. How's every eye going to see him? Could it be this? I don't know. But that's kind of what we see happening. So the Son of Man is messianic, used over 30 times alone. And so I also want to encourage you with something else here. Uh, people used to think that Jesus was one of the prophets. Look what happens here. Who do people say the Son of Man is? They're asking his disciples. And they said, some say John the Baptist. Okay, John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. He baptized people in the River Jordan. Others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. By the way, it's all reincarnation type of thing. They believe he's going to come back. It's going to be that kind of thing. All right? And they don't believe in reincarnation in that capacity, but in the prophet of that. So the first is John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was killed by Herod uh, because he was talking. He was at the time of Christ, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. And he began to criticize the politicians, and he lost his head. Note to myself, be careful about criticizing politicians. You might lose your head. That's what happened to him. Okay, he lost his head. And, uh, and, and uh, Herod thought he rose again from the dead because is this John the, he thought Jesus might have been John the Baptist resurrected. So John the Baptist, man, he didn't mess around. He just kind of told it like he was. He was tough. I mean, no miracles are recorded about him except for the fact that his teaching was very impactful. But he would speak about repentance and all of that. He had a prophetic word, obviously. He's functioned in prophecy. Behold the, the, the lamb that takes away the sins of the earth. And he was kind of that judgmental kind of guy, you know. He was kind of like that, you know, I, I just say it like it is. You know, you know people like that today. There's, there's people in the church that are like John the Baptist. They used to sit in the front, front row. You get them, pastor, sick them. You know, they, they liked it. They like, you know what I'm saying? They enjoy the, okay, nothing wrong with John the Baptist, but they like to tell like it is, right? That's one. They mentioned Elijah. And Elijah uh, was one of the prophets as well who never saw death. And he rose people from the dead and God used them. And he's kind of like the supernatural aspects. So there's people today in the church that like John the Baptist ministries. I know some pastors that are against everything. They're against being against something, right? They're even against themselves. They're against, I mean, there's, the Bible says, and they, they kind of make a big deal of the minor issues, and they're into all. I'm not saying that's John the Baptist, but that kind of attitude. Then you have Elijah. This is the church that loves signs and wonders. We love signs and wonders today, too. The Bible says, these signs shall follow those who believe in me. We don't follow signs and wonders. We follow Jesus. When we follow Jesus, we will see signs and wonders, and those come alongside of us. But the most important aspect of it is Jesus Christ and him glorified in all his gifts. So you have the Elijah, supernatural aspects. And then you have the, the Jeremiah, the compassionate, weepy guy. You know, the guy, you know, we want to help people. And we are the world and we want to feed people. And so today, even today, there's kind of like, kind of like this is going on in the church. You got the you know, fundamentalists and but nothing wrong with it. We got the, uh, you know, the signs and wonders. And, and we have, Jer by the way, Jesus is all three of those. He has aspects of all three. So why do we have to parse out and choose the one we like? We should embrace all three because all three are Jesus in as far as his ministry. He does not represent these people, but their types of ministry is what Jesus did. So people on the street thought he was one of these people, and he was not. There were a lot of misconceptions about Jesus, and uh, there are misconceptions, by the way, about Jesus today as well. I don't know if you realize that. There was all kinds of misconceptions. For example, there are people today, like for example, Muslims, 600 years after Jesus rose again from the dead, there was this guy named, by the name of Muhammad who had a, an angelic vision from this angel. Incidentally, his sister said, according to what I've read, that this is, de this is demonic, this is not of God. And he had this vision, and he was Muhammad, and he began to realize that he's the last great prophet, and God is Allah. The God in the Bible and Allah are not the same. Okay? It doesn't all come, it's different. And if you tell, if you tell a Muslim that um, Islam is the same as Christianity, you, they'll be very offended. So it isn't all just one thing. It's completely different. 
And they believe in their, in their writings, and I'm not going to try to say the name of the passage. It's, I think it's Sarah, uh, 4, 157 through 159. says he was not crucified, and he did not rise again from the dead. But Jesus is a great prophet, but Muhammad is the last great prophet who put the final on it. And so Jesus is good. So you can talk to Muslims about Jesus. They're, they're cool with that. Just don't call him God, and don't say he rose again from the dead. And Muhammad is number one. That's what they believe. Okay, but it's different. They don't believe he is God. Okay, then we also had, and by the way, that's written six centuries after we had parts of the Bible that were written from 60 to 100 AD. Okay, then we also have uh, people like the Mormons. You remember with the Mormons? Joseph Smith in 1840 to 1860, he was in a place, uh, can you believe it or not, that Jesus came from upstate New York? Palmyra, New York. Joseph Smith was in the mountains. He was known to be involved with the Freemasons. He was also known to, to smoke peyote, which is a hallucinogenic. So I don't know what happened, but he met this angel called Morai, M-O-R-N-I, where we get the word, sounds like close to moron, but I'm just telling you, <laughs> Morani, Morani, okay? I, I, my friends, if you look into Mormonism, it is the most crazy thing you'd ever I mean Marvel's Thor makes more sense that's it's that bad it, it's crazy and, and by the way they use God speak you know what God speak is God speak is using the same vocabulary listen I'm not making fun of it I'm just telling you the truth God speak is using the same vocabulary with different meanings okay so you say son of God does not mean God it means a son of God and they actually believe that Satan Lucifer and Jesus were brothers and they also believe that you and I can have our own planet and have a bunch of virgins. It's, it's wonderful if you know, that's what you believe in, right? They're also against black people. They were called curse. It wasn't until 1978 or mid-70s. Oh, we can't do that anymore. There's racism involved with that too. Horrible. And it's not Christianity. Jesus is not God. He is a he is one of us, an ascended master, if you will, in some ways, in, in that regard. So, and, and also, you can't find these golden tablets that, that, that um, Joseph Smith found. He apparently put these ray bands on. He read these golden You can't find these golden tablets. They talk about these ancient civilizations that lived here in North America. You dig and dig and dig, and you find nothing. You go to Israel, you dig, you find the city of David. You find Hezekiah's tunnel. You find Jericho. You find all these places the Bible talks about. You can, uh, you can verify through a lot of archaeological digs that what the Bible says actually happened. In the Mormonism, you can't find anything like that. It, let me tell you, it is a great deception. It's not the same as Christianity. Jesus and Satan are not brothers. Or how about maybe involved with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses? who believe that Jesus is an, uh, the archangel Michael. And, that, and by the way, all these religions do not believe, the cults do not believe Jesus is God. They say he is a son of God, but he is not God. He's not God. And so that's how you can tell. What do people say about Jesus? They say he's not God, then you know it's a cult. How about in Hinduism? Well, he's just one of the great shamas, and he's one of the great, you know, like Krishna, and he's, you know, or like Buddha. He's like an ascended master who got in touch with his feelings, right? Well, they wouldn't put Jesus on the cross for getting in touch with his feelings. They put Jesus on the cross because he said he was God. He didn't say he was like God or he knew God. He says, I am God. In fact, let, let me show you what Jesus had to say. In John, this is not exhaustive, but part of it. John 14, 9, this is what Jesus says. Philip asks, show us the Father. Well, show us what, this is what Jesus says. Have I been with you this time, Philip? And yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? So where in the Bible does Jesus come out and say he is God? What has basically happened is this. You ever hear Johnny Appleseed? Pretty cool guy, right? He went around with the, but the kind of hipped around and just kind of threw apple seeds everywhere. So every time you have an apple seed and you have an apple tree, you bought an apple, thank God for Johnny Appleseed. I, grew, I learned that in grammar school, which they now call elementary school. 
Okay, I learned that. How about Paul Bunyan, right? Do you ever get four or five, ever get 12 people in a row and, and whisper into someone's ear and they call, call, call telephone and you just tell the next person, Sally crossed the road and put a quarter in the machine for, for parking. And by the time it gets to the other place, Sally is a terrorist from Iran. I mean, what? <laughs> how did that happen? So how do we trust oral tradition? Well, I, we can't trust that. Well, people took Jesus and they made him more than he was. He never claimed to be God. Yeah, he did. Jesus said the following, the Father and I are one. He says, I am the light of the world. He says, I am. When Moses met God on, on uh, Mount Sinai, he said, who shall I say sent me? You tell him the great I am is. He says, he says I am. He uses the same phraseology saying he's God. He says, uh, I and the Father are one. I'm not like God. I am God. In John 10, 31 to 33, once again, the people picked up stones. They're getting ticked off at Jesus because it's teaching. Why? Jesus said, at my, father, at my Father's direction, I have done many good works. For which one are you going to stone me? Okay, why are you going to stone Jesus for? They replied, we're stoning you not for any good work. See, that, that's not why they put Jesus on the cross. Not because of his teaching. Not, no, why? But for blaspheming, you, a mere man, claim to be God. That's why Jesus was crucified. Not because he's a great moral teacher, not because he was a good, no. He was crucified because a mere man said he was God and the Jewish people had none part of that and you and I would have done the same thing if we were not in the same set of circumstances, chances are. So you, a mere man, claim to be God. In Hebrews it says this, he, that's Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Now, this is confusing. We're not going to be able to solve God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We get the word Trinity, not in the Bible, but we use that as a theological term. How many of you ever talk to yourself? You guys are crazy. Now, I talk to my, and if you answer back, you're in trouble. No, I talk to myself all the time, right? I have conversations. Hey, Eric, what's your problem? I don't know what my problem is. I, I go back and forth and think I'm Caesar or Augustus. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, I talk to myself, and so do you. But have you noticed you got a body, too? Your body talks to you. I'm hungry. I mean, maybe not say it out loud, but, man, it tells you, right? Some of you are hangry right now. That's why we have a bunch of things you shouldn't be eating in the lobby, okay? And if you join the Dream Team, you'd have bishops, 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 biscuits and gravy. That's what we have for the Dream Team, by the way. It's good. Anyhow, so what happens is your body talks to you, right? So why do we struggle with that? How about an avocado? That's supposed to be so good for you. I don't like them. You have, the, you have the pit in the middle. You have the gooey junk in the middle. And then you have the skin, right? It's all three. So we're made in the image of God. And so some people think we're trying you, and I, I think we are. So, you know, you, you talk to your, there's a commanding center of you, right? You make a decision. You have a conversation with yourself, do you not? Your body's like, I can't do it. I mean, come on, everybody. Some of you can't not negotiate a set of stairs anymore. Some of us, when we, when, we, when we tie our shoes, before we get up, we say, what else can I do when I'm down here? Because <laughs> your body's like. So your body talks to you, right? So is it that hard to understand? We're made in the image of God. So there's no question that God the Father is the commanding aspect of God. But he's three personalities in one, just like you are multi-personality people. Okay, he's the radiance of the gospel of God, uh, of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and upholds the universe by the word of his power, that Christ holds the universe together. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. For Jesus to sit down, it's one thing if he stands, but he sat down at the right hand of God, which simply means I'm God. That's a big deal. They sit it down with Christ, with God, the Father, okay? And so we see that, and the majesty on high. Now, it also says in John 1, 14, and the Word became, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. It doesn't say he, the Word was a God. It says the Word was God, was God. And so very clear, John an eyewitness of Jesus said 
that Jesus said he was God. He and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. So, Jesus asked the question now. First he says, who do people say I am? He wasn't like, you. Well, who do people say I am? He wasn't asking about social media likes. He wanted to ask the people, who do you people say I am? Right in front of a pagan center full of debauchery and disgusting things, paganism. There was no Judaism going on at that place. There was paganism. Why would Jesus take you to Las Vegas in front of a brothel and ask you who he is? That's kind of what he did in that section. Well, who do you say I am? My question to you is, who do you say Jesus is, is the most important question. And Simon Peter said the following, you are the Christ, Christos. It's used, uh, there's over 300 prophecies about Christos, Messiah. He's called the anointed one. And what did Jesus say he was? He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So Peter's feel like, well, I'm pretty, pretty good about myself. And what did Jesus say? He answered him and said, Blessed are you, Simon. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. What do you mean? But my Father who is in heaven. This is the truth. According to Romans chapter 1 and other places. Everyone in this world knows there's a God someplace. Even an atheist knows there's a God. How do you know that? Because inside of them, why do they fight against something that doesn't exist? People know there's something more, right? The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that they, although they, they knew God, they see the glory of his creation, they ignore it, right? And so what happens is people have a God consciousness. And if, what happens is if you continue to push that away, push that away, push that away, push it away, your heart gets hardened. But it takes God to know God. And Jesus said, anyone who wants to come after me, come to me. So the invitation is for everybody. So some people push God away. That's why God has us partially going out there, spreading the gospel, working in concert with them. Okay? So he speaks to us. And so he, right here, for flesh and blood has revealed this to you. But my father, my father did this, not your flesh and blood. So my father gave you the ability, Jesus. And if you think you saved yourself, you didn't. You just responded to what Christ has done for you by the power of the Holy Spirit. So flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, Peter. And the word Peter means rock. It means rock. It's actually in the feminine. He didn't say, I'm going to make you the Pope from now on. I know that's what some of our Catholic brothers and sisters believe, and God bless them, but that's not what the Bible says. It says Peter, which means a feminine word of rock, actually can mean a little pebble, a little stone, a chip off the old block, right? Uh, but and I tell you, Peter, little stone, and on this rock, which is feminine, which actually means like a big boulder, I will build my church. In other words, on your confession, what you've said, anyone that joins with that confession is being built. I'm the chief cornerstone. I'm being built upon that rock. And, okay, and I will build my rock on this church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So am I worried about how bad the culture is getting? Not really. I mean, I'm concerned. First of all, this is not Israel. This is the United States of America. We're not the promised land. But we have adopted Judeo-Christian values, and our government reflects that, and that's why we're such a blessed country. This place was dedicated to the Lord in many ways, but we're turning our back on God. Am I worried? I'm concerned, but guess what? The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. I, they tried, the Romans tried it. It didn't work. The Byzantines tried it, right? Communism tried it. It doesn't work. You can't touch Christ. Christ is the overarching, and we're more than conquerors through him. So don't worry about it. We're on the winning side, everybody. They cannot overdo us, no matter what they try. Well, I'm concerned. I'm, not, I'm concerned, but I'm not concerned. I'm concerned to, to make a difference in the world. I want to make a difference in America, and we're going to do everything we can. We're not going to just kind of sit here. No, we're to be salt and light. We're to be involved with government, be involved with school districts. Yeah, do all that, but doing the love of Christ. But I'm not freaking out. I'm on the winning side. I know who wins the final four. I bet a lot of money on it. <laughs> just kidding. I don't bet. 
But we know that Jesus won the final four. We have, we have the inside track. I'm putting all my chips and all my money on that. And boy, there's dividends on the other side of that. But to all, and I ask the worship team to make their way up, but to all who received him, that's Jesus, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So listen, everybody, we're entering a challenging season. My question to you is, what are you going to do with Jesus? Jesus said he was God. He didn't say he was a way to heaven. He said, I'm the only way. I'm the only truth. I'm the only life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The reason why they killed Jesus, because he said he was God. What are you going to do with Jesus today? My question to you, what are you going to do with Jesus today? And since it's so important, why not spread the good news? And I should bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, in the matchless name of Jesus right now, I thank you. You said in the scriptures to all who receive you, become children of God. Lord, I pray you would touch every single person in this room right now. And every person watching online. Holy Spirit, I pray you begin to move in the lives of people right now. Holy Spirit, you're the one that does the work. I'm just bringing the news, but you're the one that makes it happen. I pray you touch every heart right now. How many of you would say today, and I, I do this every week, it's the most important thing I believe I do every week. If you were to die today, do you absolutely positively know you'd be in heaven with God? The Bible says it's appointed for man and woman to die once. Then comes the judgment. If you stand before God, what are you going to say to him? Well, I'm a pretty good person. It doesn't cut it, everybody. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous. No, not one. There's only one way a man and woman can be saved. It's through Jesus Christ. That you receive what he's done for you. That Jesus took your place, took the punishment you rightly deserved. And when we put our faith in Jesus, you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. That's number one. Number two, you have to be willing. And by the way, that's not enough. To believe he rose again from the dead and he's Jesus, that's, that's great. But that doesn't save you. That's part of it. What saves you is something very, very important. From the very beginning, from the book of Genesis, are you going to let God be God? Or are you going to be God? If you're still God, you're not saved. You're a person who likes the Christian philosophy. A philosophy of who God is does not save you. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is beyond behavior. This is a decision to follow Jesus and deny yourself. You're made in the image of God, and God's calling you to himself. If you've never given your life to Jesus, today is the day. Don't wait. Maybe some of you, you, you're, you've fallen away, you want to get right. Don't wait. Today's the day. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I do this every week. And would you please write, let me know, uh, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ for the first time, or I want to renew that commitment. Nice and high. Can I see your hand? Hold it high. Thank you. Until I see your hand, then put it down. Anyone else today? Thank you. Anyone else today? Anyone online? You can click that. Okay, let's pray this prayer together in Jesus' name. In the pride of our heart, Lord Jesus, I believe you are God. I believe you came to earth and you died on the cross to take my place and you rose again from the dead. Today, I willingly step down and declare, I am not God, you are. I give you complete control of my life. I hand my life over to you right now. Come fill me now, I pray, in Jesus' name.